yeah so uh yeah to tell us uh, where where who are you where are you in the world uh i'm nick suzanis i'm a comics maker and professor of comics y stuff um in san francisco where i teach at san francisco state and run a comic studies program here and san francisco has been deluged for the last three weeks with rain which is rare for us um but it but it stopped and the sun has come out so that's where i'm at Yeah, so how did I come to comics and education? Um, so, uh, like probably many kids my age, I was into comics as a kid. It was, um, I had an older brother who read comics to me and read comics with me. So I ended up with Batman as my first word. Um, as in junior high, I made my own comic. Uh, I made uh, my own series called Locker Man. And he makes a, a cameo appearance in my dissertation many, many, many years later. Um, but when I came to undergrad, uh, doing comics was didn't exist. And uh, even if it did, I wanted to do intellectual things and intellectual things and comics were not on the same page. Uh, so I, I was still into comics. I would still draw things, but uh, I studied mathematics as an undergrad. Um, and it sort of prompted this this interesting thing for me in recent years. Uh, when 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 you study mathematics, people say, "So what do you do?" And you say, "Oh, I, I study mathematics." They say, "Oh, you're so smart." And um, when you're known for making art, which I am now, they say, "Oh, you're so talented." And I I see that sort of funny dividing line. Um, like I think I was a really clever and talented mathematician. I don't know how smart I was, but in making my art, uh, my art allows me to be smarter than I could be without it. So a lot of goals in my current work and my teaching is how do I, I, I see people, have people see both sides of that and see that they're part of that. Um, so like I said, there's this dip in my comics making um, from sort of college years and a little beyond that. And then uh, I came back to it I came back to it uh, a little bit later, and um, and uh, this was for a political art show around the 2004 U.S. presidential election, and and I, I in that that work I sort of turned away from the sort of superheroes and funny stories that I'd made, and and made an essay, comic as essay, and using the the metaphorical potential of images and the way images and and text could speak to each other, and and saw that I could really get some complex meaning across. Um, and so that really sparked some ideas for me. I'd, I'd always been interested in education, um, but I, I'd always been a little bit shy of academia. I mean, I have an undergrad and I have a master's degree in, in interdisciplinary studies and math and art, um, but I always was uh, uh, just reluctant to commit to that because it felt like a lot of the things that happen in academia stay in academia. Um, but what I saw with my comics was not only was I doing this thing that I loved to do as a kid, but that I could bring this way of working and combine it with my concerns about education and put them in together and, and create something that didn't simplify the ideas I was after, but really, uh, really allowed me to get at them in a deeper way and bring them to a broader audience. Um, so I opted, you know, I looked to get my doctorate. I, I liked being in the, uh, you know, I was teaching as a adjunct and I, I really liked being part of that, but it's not, it's not a sustainable job. So I thought, oh, I'll get my doctorate. And then because I was doing this comics work, I'm like, this is what I wanna do. Um, I didn't see it as particularly groundbreaking. I, I thought the argument for comics as scholarship had kind of been won with the existence of Mouse and understanding comics from Scott McCloud and uh, Persepolis, Marjane Satrapi's uh, Persepolis, but um, but it hadn't been won um, completely. And so, you know, so I ended up drawing my dissertation as a comic book, um, which was subsequently published as Unflattening, um, which which really pointed a direction towards new scholarship and, and the work itself ended up, wasn't my original intent, but ended up becoming an argument for why comics as scholarship and other things, other forms of scholarship ought to be part of what we do in academia and, and why these things matter and why they help us be more ourselves. So, so like I said, I was a comics maker as a kid. I made them through high school. I did make them in college, but I actually did a 
philosophy, independent study uh, as a comic, but I never finished it. It was an overly ambitious project um, with a very generous teacher. Um, um, but I but I studied mathematics, and then when I graduated, I, I was a tennis player, so I, I traveled around playing tennis, and I thought about making comics about, um, uh, you know, life on the tour. Um, and then I stopped playing, and... Um, I kept making comics on the side. Uh, I made my living as a tennis player, as a tennis pro, uh, all the way through the end of doctoral school. So that was, you know, so I had this job that I could you know, keep moving and think a lot about how people learn, but learn through their bodies. Um, but it allowed me to do a whole bunch of other things. And and I was in Detroit where I ran, a, I started and ran an arts magazine. So I wrote about the arts and you know, still there's little bits of comics in my background, but I mean, my in the background, but I'm not, uh, I'm not devoting any real time to it. And then with this invitation to this political art show, uh, I, I have to do it, right? I have to make something and I only have a few days. So I turned to comics and, and in doing that, I really saw, I just saw the sort of fusion of my interests and my, my sort of creative skill come together. So I, I think like as an undergrad, even if comics like in a school of illustration or something had been an option, I think I would have dismissed it as like, well, that's just kind of fun. That's sort of for entertainment. And I want to do, you know, the intellectual stuff. And I, I don't think I would have made the connection to say, oh, this is intellectual stuff. It's just in a different form than we're used to. So it's really these 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 political comics around the 2004 election that like opened things up for me. And I saw this like um, I saw the potential for what I could do with them. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, we organized an exhibition around games and art. And uh, a buddy of mine just said, why don't you make the uh, the essay as a as a comic book? So I did this longer form comic on games and art. Uh, it's sort of it's on the history of games, uh, how games, how games work, rules, and then it sort of applies it to philosophy of life, and and it's those pieces that really set things, set the tone for what I would do going forward, and and then when I came to Columbia, I said this is the kind of stuff I can do. I can make you know I can wrestle with big ideas, um, I can put deep content in there, but it comes in a sort of way that 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 is. That is kind of subversive. I mean, I think I see my comics as subversive in that, you know, they 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 seem accessible. I mean, I think they are accessible, but they the depth of meaning is kind of hidden. The way I strip out a lot of the uh, it can be divisive language when you're talking politics, but I strip out academic language. I I strip out jargon and replace it with metaphor. So. You know, a big question I get with my work is what is it about? You know, so when students, undergraduate classes wrestle with it, often everybody in the class has a different idea. You know, like my, my work is about education, I think. Right. But but I never say that. And so mm -hmm. students, you know, have different takes. And I, and I like that because it allows them to find their own way. In. Um, it, I think you still get the kernel uh, of what the meaning is about. But um but you might apply it differently depending on which walk of life you come from or when in your walk, you know, when in your life you come to it. Yeah, so circuitous is definitely a, a, a good word to describe my, uh, my path. Though I, looking at it uh, from the, you know, from the present, it's not so circuitous, circuitous, but looking at it while it's happening, definitely a lot of meandering going there. Um, so let me, uh, so again, uh, I made comics as a kid. I played sports as a kid. I kept playing tennis as a as a college student and beyond, and then kept teaching it beyond. Um, I, uh, and, but in college, I studied mathematics because that's what I did. I made comics on the side, but it's, again, it stays on the side, stays on the side. Um, in Detroit, I run an arts magazine. Again, I'm I'm teaching tennis to pay for everything, and I did end up teaching at the university there. I, I so so I got a master's at that time in D Detroit at Wayne State University. Uh, in I made up. I, I thought I might do a degree in mathematics, like a doctorate in that, because why not? Um, yeah. And uh, I I took some classes, and I stumbled into an interdisciplinary studies program. So I like oh. 
I started taking art classes there. So I said, well, I'll, I'll make up my own degree in math and art. So I, I did that and I wrote this big thesis on creativity across disciplines, um, which many of the like pieces of it ended up falling into what I did for, for my, my doctorate. Um, and while I was there, I took so many art classes. Uh, I, I, um, I ended up getting a, a fine arts degree at the same time. So I have two masters that I kind of did at the same time. Um, so just, I was just there and I was doing stuff. So I was young enough that I could do, you know, you could, you could try a lot of things, right. While you're doing whatever else you're doing. Um, and then that uh, uh, two weeks before a semester started, somebody fell through for their public speaking course. And they, I happened to be at a wedding with somebody and they said, would you teach this? So I, I said, sure. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. Like I, I wasn't a particularly skilled public speaker, but the opportunity to watch people grow um, was really fantastic. And I, I loved it. And it definitely, as somebody who's now done an enormous amount of public speaking all over the world now, um, it really helped me like be ready to do that, to just drop into something and say, oh, I'm ready. I think I really hit a time where people were hungry for something different. Um, and, you know, they might not have known anything about comics, but I think they knew that I knew enough about comics and that I, I was determined enough to, to find my own way and teach them about it, which is what I ended up doing. Um, but I, I mostly naively sort of dropped into these things. I, I, I said, that sounds interesting. I'll try it. And, and I was stable enough in my life that I could get away with that. Um, and, and, and honestly, teaching tennis uh, as a job that pays pretty well um, for hourly work uh, and lets you move around a lot, it meant you could do, I could do other, I could use it to fund other things I did. Um, so it worked out. Uh, so I'm going to take you back a little bit to show you some stuff about how I came to thinking about comics, I think. And um, just to slight recap, as I said, I was into comics as a little kid. Batman is my first word because of having an older brother. And and then I went and made and I was you know I kept I made comics all the time, but I made my own series with this locker man in, in seventh, uh, eighth grade, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing about narrative because. I, we had locker partners. I don't. I don't know what you have in what in England, but we had big lockers, and you had to share it with somebody. And um, and I just like made this little sketch of like a superhero with with I showed like it was just a half a page, uh, for my my like the guy I shared a locker with, and I thought this would be kind of fun. And then once I started it, all of a sudden all these ideas exploded out, and I had this whole like character, and he had to you know so. It, I did it for the next five years, but it was just this, like, I want to make a sketch to do something in our locker. Um, and then it turned into an ongoing thing for me. And, and uh, you know, so that idea that, that uh, you know, you just don't know where it's going to start um, and, and where it's going to take you. Um, and that certainly took me a long ways. So, so like I said, I have this gap in comics making for, I mean, I, there's a lot of unfinished projects in there, but but mostly, yeah, a lot of unfinished things. Um, but I, I, in 2004, I, I made this comic about uh, for the 2004 presidential election. And this first one is about security. And you, you can see in it that I'm in it. Like I'm a character in it sort of telling you stuff. Um, and I was greatly influenced, uh, as you'll see pretty clearly here, by Scott McCloud's uh, really seminal uh, work from 1993, Understanding Comics. So comics people will all know this. Um, Scott, it's an amazing book. It's used a lot in all kinds of courses uh, from, from, from comics, obviously, to, to uh, web design. Um, and Scott sort of uh, pioneered this, this, this thing of, of himself telling stories and taking us through it. So Scott's avatar is always present in the comic. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to click there. Um, his avatar, oh, it doesn't matter. His avatar is always present and and guiding us through. And it's and it's great. And I, I think, you know, when I first started thinking about comics as essay, that that was the model that I turned to. Um, uh, we may get stopped here. Um, anyhow, 
shortly after that, I uh, we had I had did the second there was a second art show and I I was asked to be in it again and and I wanted to break away from that um, and I was familiar and, and quite loved this uh, essay comic by Alan Moore and Melinda Gebby called This Is Information it was a it was a tribute it was a nine eleven tribute comic and and rather than themselves or some character telling a story it was this play of words and pictures and and symbols. Um, and that really struck a chord with me as 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 a powerful way to use comics. So the the sort of follow up to mine, which was two weeks after that first one, I quite literally smashed my avatar, my narrator avatar, right right off the bat. And it's this metaphorical thing about voting, or you know, a show of hands, right? It's all everything is a hand, and so that sort of play of it, every panel is like I've got to think of a hand that works with that. Um, and that really became, I have more works like that. I did a thing about how ridiculous the concept of of dividing people by red and blue in my country is, um, using all fictional red and blue characters. Um, and I've continued to do things like that. I won't, I won't take you through all of that now. Um, in Unflattening, I have a thing about how ridiculous or, or the name comics is or how, how mistreated the word comics is, not ridiculous. Um, and I, I started with thinking about uh, Shakespeare's a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And I said, comics is I prefer by any other name would smell as sweet. And every single panel has something to do with a rose. So there's this thing that holds it together, but yet it's kind of a disparate, um, you know, there's no character, there's no real story there. There's the images that hold it together. So for me, the sort of generation of pages of story is this play of, 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 of trying a different images and words together and seeing how they start to to lead to something. Um, so I want to jump from that and let's see if I can jump sort of smoothly here um, to how I think there is so up. much because this is such a tease seeing <laughs> seeing these, all I'm these images. See I can. Oh, it's, it's my this it is so. I mean, I, 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 when you when I stood in your comic and you showed me that that narrative doesn't just go left to right, top to bottom, I I, I literally it was like seeing the world differently. It doesn't happen very often, you know, in a person's life, and and that was one of the moments for me. And seeing all these slides just reminds me of this. Please don't as assume that uh, your audience knows all the stuff that you know. They're not all going to be illustrators that are familiar no, with. No, no. Well, fair enough. Um, I mean, I still want to drag the guys down into all of this. Um, well, well, let me ask you one more question because it looks like we're gonna the time's gonna time out in five minutes. Don't worry. Well, if it's all right with you, we'll just start again. If if they just oh, is that okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, I want to tell you guys about a little bit about comics themselves, but I'll just I'll give you a flyover of unflattening. Um, unflattening. This was my dissertation. Uh, so it's entirely a comic book, uh, the first ish of its kind. Um, it's a little hard to claim that or not, but um, and it came out as this book on graphic novel, comic book, unflattening. Um, it is, in my view, very much an argument for uh, some changes in education um, and pushing back against sort of education as a system of 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 steps and procedures and uh, sort of a recipe. Um, you know, where learning is divided up into into boxes of time and space and subject. And, and and to come back to the sort of art and mathematics and tennis thing, it's certainly a little bit of an argument for myself. Like, you know, I think we tend to see the person who studies art and is interested in mathematics or vice versa as kind of freakish. And then you say, oh, and they're also an athlete. And you say, well, that's really weird. But I, but I really think, you know, we've been dry, drawing these artificial boxes around ourselves and that that restricts who we can be as humans you know we we artificially say well i can't be these two things cuz i'm not supposed to be and and i don't buy that at all um you know i mean i think i was very lucky to have a family background that supported me to try things and and edu you know i come from a background of educators who tried things um so i yeah so some part of this work is definitely an argument for that um and I, I, I'm, I'm going to jump over it just for the, just for the sake of, of, of jumping to other things. Um, but I think to, to talk about comics specifically, uh, you know, we're in this time that I can have a comics program about comics when, when not that long before I couldn't even think of studying comics. 
but yet, you know, so we see comics as kind of a new medium, but they're really not. I mean, this is the origin of comics uh, in the United States. It's sort of as a publishing form. And this is the Yellow Kid from the 1890s. Um, you can look back farther, the 1830s, the, the, the Swiss artist Rudolf Topfer, who may have not had that huge an impact, but he was doing things that, you know, that we look back now on and say, well, that's the sort of the grandfather of comics. But really, the sort of making sense of the world of, uh, through picture stories, um, you know, illuminated manuscripts, the Bayou Tapestry, uh, Mayan codices, uh, Trajan's Column, which is you know, nearly 2000 years old, Egyptian murals, which are, are, you know, even older, and then things like Lascaux cave paintings. You know, I'm not going to say that's a comic book, um, but but that's like people trying to make sense of their world is through images is as old as we've been us. And so we live in a culture where, where, uh, you know, where words have sort of been the dominant words and numbers have been the, the dominant way we count as scholarship and pictures have been things you put over your couch. Um, they're things that you illustrate with. And I think we've sort of left out part of ourselves. Um, so, so let me say a little bit about comics and, um, I, you know, just for people, you know, some people will be familiar with this, some people won't. Um, and, and think about the affordances of them, like, what can I do with comics? And, and that, that to me seems, you know, definitions are important, but what I can do with comics is, is even more important. Um, so here, uh, Scott McCloud's understanding comics, this is his definition. And, and, and the beauty of his definition is it opens up it takes comics away from being like, oh, it's about Batman or or Donald Duck and says it's a form of communication. And so he says juxtapose pictorial and other images and deliberate sequence. So that simply means here's my fist. Here's a nice box around my fist. And then in another static image next to it, here's my extended fist. Two static images. Nothing's moving. Nothing's happening. But the reader, the reader is animating this. Right? The reader is making the action happen. The reader is bringing it to life. Like you said uh, with narrative earlier, like, like we're taking these sort of disconnected events and we're bringing meaning to them. And we can't help do that, right? And I, I think one of the big keys in this is that time, time is written in space. The passage of time is written in space. So, you know, here, I, here I've redrawn a, a Paleolithic lunar calendar uh, from about 30,000 years ago where you know they're, they're observing the phases of the moon changing from day to day and like how do you make sense of that how do you understand what's going on um well you you uh, you observe these events in time and you graphically note them in a spatial sequence that's the tools you have you don't have video you don't have animation you don't have those things but you've got this flat static surface and you can make marks and start to understand time so i think comics are are kind of weirdly uh weirdly good at, at explaining at thinking about time, even though they don't move, they don't do anything. Um, so um, there's a lot to say about time. I, I, I might jump all that because we don't want to have every single thing you can I can do. But I'll jump to the other side and maybe uh, we want to hear about time. I think this don't feel as though don't feel as though right. you, you're, you're indulging yourself because um, <laughs> you know this is <laughs> the, you know all this stuff about narrative is really where we want to dig around. So all right, uh, yeah. Um, so we're talking about, uh, you know, comics, this this curiously static medium um, being particularly good at, at, at handling time. Um, so, you know, the passage of time is written in space. So I, I guess I'll move on from there. Um, and so a lot of people have talked about this. Right. Uh, so this is Will Eisner, who's a master of comics and one of the first people to sort of write about uh, how comics work as part of his own work and his teaching. Um but I like this his idea here that 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 time in comics is a bit rel you know it's a like relativity in physics. So you move you know you might dwell a long time on a on a panel or you might you might move quickly right. It all kind of depends on on how you want to experience uh, the comic. And you're not when when we watch a movie right the it's no longer cogs of the film strip. But but at some point right you move in with cogs in the film strip. That's that's how. Uh, that's how movies work. So in the uh, media theorist Marshall McLuhan's terminology, uh, uh, movies are a hot medium because you're you're in the theater and you're really immersed in it. And comics are really cool 
because you can go at your own speed, you can flip back and forth, you can. So, so the, the use of time in comics is quite different. And McLeod explains here, like, um, you know, sure, time happens between panels, but it could be a snap or it could be a million years. There's no neat conversion chart between them. And in fact, I love this example with my students, like the time between this guy asking a question, and him responding, it might depend on how many panels you put in between the two. It might depend on the length of the panel you put between the two. It might be depend on the sort of gap you put between panels. And it might even, it may even be the lack of a border. Like all those things, all those sort of spatial elements um, matter. And so you can do simple things. Like I, I like this very simple cartoon. Um, you know, this little girl, uh, the repetition, the repetition of <clears throat> the frames, the repetition of the color of her hair and her outfit um, allows you to see that, yes, this is the same person taking place over time. Super simple, right? But uh, but, it, but a pretty neat way of dealing with time. I'm going to jump over a couple things. So so comics handle time really well. Uh, and we so we've talked about comics as a sequential art. So left to right, top to bottom. And, and, and sort of the heart of how I think about them is the, the, the nature of simultaneity, of things happening all at once, which means, you know, you read my page here, left to right, top to bottom, but you can't help but start to make connections from the lower right back to the upper left and in multiple directions because you're taking it in all at once. You're, you're seeing this whole page all at one time, which means you might, might that, that's not only true across the page, but it's true within an, an individual panel. So maybe here you're reading rather associations that stretch web-like across the page. And then maybe you notice there's a spider and a spider web right there. So you start to draw inferences back and forth between image and text and image and text. Um, and so it starts to break the sort of nature, uh, the sort of hierarchical nature of reading, you know, where we're, we're reading in a chain, left to right, left to right, left to right, moving down. Um, it starts to, to, to rip that up a little bit and allow some other kinds of ways of reading. Um, and this has, this has potential for how we think about time. So this is a panel from Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, um, where the character of Dr. Manhattan is this time-displaced, uh, character who's sort of a stand-in for the reader, um, sort of a stand-in for how we read comics. So in the center panel, he says, there's no future, there is no past, do you see? Well, it, the, these two panels here are taking place in the past, but they're coming after these other panels. So it's sort of, we're seeing, we're seeing all of time all at once. And as the reader of comics, and as this particular character who has this higher thing, as McLeod said, that's a little less a part of his theory, you know, thinking about the panels around him, both past and future are real and visible all around us. So you have this experience of <clears throat> the sequential and the simultaneous all at once. And I think what's what to me is really interesting about it is like we move through time in a sequential fashion. At least I assume most of us do, right? We move from from breakfast, you know, from getting up to breakfast to classes to job to lunch to whatever. But when we're in a conversation or you're hearing this, you might, you know, you think of something like, oh, that makes me think of that, or you're anticipating doing that. So your thoughts are going in this sort of sideways all at once, even as your your life is moving sequentially through. And I think comics do this, this hold those, both of those modes, the sort of sequential linear thing with the all at once simultaneous uh, ways that our thoughts work. So I really think that the, that flat surfaces, there's this great power in being static and flat because it allows you to care about both drawing and meta drawing at the same time. I care about both the, the whole and the individual drawings um, <clears throat> together. I think I said that backwards. So just give you a couple examples. This is from the French cartoonist Marc-Antoine Matou's um, Museum Vault. And so we might see, I, I could give this to you as nine panels, like a slideshow. Um, but if you give it to you all at once, um, you might notice in the background that this triangle or pyramid is being made through all the images, this simultaneous image. And this comic is about the Louvre, which has this pyramid out in front. So he's he's making he's making an image with the whole, even as he's allowing you to read sequence. Um, this is a simple example from Frank King's Gasoline Alley from sometime in the 1930s. Um, 
And the character bumbles through what is a single simultaneous scene. But it's weirder than just the fact that he's doing stuff and everything else is static. He keeps restarting on the left. And he keeps, and it doesn't make any sense, right? Like he doesn't get to the left and then jump back here. And it doesn't make any sense at all. If you, but, but we're accustomed to reading left to right, left to right, left to right. So you just kind of take it for granted that we're watching him bumble, even though if you tried to map it out, he'd have to be teleporting back and forth. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So this is from David Mazzuchelli's Asterius Polyp. On the left here, you see sort of sequence, and then the sequence gets all jumbled sort of all at once, and the character's reflecting on that. Simultaneity, the awareness of so much happening at once, is now the most salient aspect of contemporary life. And I think comics really handle that. They handle it, they allow you to do both, both you know, philosophical things, but also just kind of the funny and weird things, like this little guy trying to get his fruit, um, and he can't figure it out, he can't figure it out, and then he marches up against the hill on this and, and breaks across the panel. So there's a lot of very strange, strange narrative storytelling things comics can do, um, which maybe I'll, I'll jump over. Um, I'm going to jump to something else here. But I think to sort of come back to how I think about him is, is beyond, uh, you know, we, we tend to think of comics as images plus text. And, and hopefully in thinking about McLeod's definition, which doesn't mention words at all, um, we think about sequence of images. And then thinking about what I said is it's sequence of images, but also considerations of the whole, considerations of how the whole works. Um, and so one of my big decisions, besides this sort of metaphorical uh, play of, of image and text that, that generated so much of my work, was how the reader experiences the page. So in this example, uh, this is from a chapter on ruts, I, I wanted to contrast uh, the typical commuter who goes out and back, right? A commuter goes out and back. They go to their job, they come back. They go out um, with my wife's commute uh, when we were in Manhattan, where she went to different things every day and in a different sequence. Um, and so in a sort of illustrational sense, I could have said, and here's one hand, here's, here's a typical commuter, and here's my wife. And they're different, right? I could stand there and explain that. But what I wanted to do is, how does the page do it? So in the background here, I've got uh, a 16 grid. And in the 16 grid, I've done the typical commuter across Manhattan. So it's boom, 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 boom. It just does the same thing. Um, Meanwhile, I've mapped a number of her different routes, and these were all real, um, onto Manhattan, which sort of drifts across the page like it's a leaf or a feather sort of falling in the way that she sort of drifted through the city. Um, and so it's, it's fairly simple. You still read in left to right fashion, but there's multiple layers of information coming to you at once. Um, you're, you can be aware of the background, this beats, you know, it's a, it's still a flat piece of paper, but, but we can read all this different level of complexity, the sequential and the simultaneous at once. And this is maybe a better, even better example. Uh, I did a comic for the Boston Globe, um, and it's, it's, it's about entropy. So how things fall apart, but it's specifically about the, the few things, the moments that go against that flow. Uh, things like life that sort of emerge from it. So the the upper part of the comic, uh, so it reads left to right, left to right, as like time runs out, omelets don't turn back into eggs, your clothes won't pick themselves up, and your coffee grows cold, right? That's the linear flow of time, of entropy. And so it continues that. And and over here, it sort of, it, this kicks you over to here. And then you read down the page. And then all of a sudden, you're asked to read right to left, which you're not used to doing. And then you're asked to read bottom to top, which you're definitely not used to doing before you're kicked out around through the page. So my goal with this was how do I make a page that feels like the experience I'm talking about? How do I make something that is, uh, you know, that that reflects the sort of linear, but also pushes against it? And And to be honest, I make complicated drawings um, but the complicated drawings are nothing compared to trying to figure out what I'm going to draw, how to move you through the page and trying, you know, so I have 50 pages in my notebook where I'm trying to figure out what's the right, what, oops, 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 I clicked on, sorry, 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 uh, where I try to figure it out before eventually I find like, oh, I can do that. And then, and there's still lots to work out. There's plenty of details to work out, but at least now I know what I want the reader how I want them to dance. And I'm going to say a couple more words about that in a minute. 
Um, so I think a big thing for me is to think about comics. Uh, you know, we tend to think about them as prose plus illustration. So if I draw good noses and I can write good words, I'm a good comics maker. But but I think that rules a lot of people out. But if we instead think about comics as the Canadian cartoonist Seth says, as poetry plus graphic design, then we're really thinking about the space. We're thinking about how to move ideas around in space. And that opens up comics to, to really everyone who can make marks with their body. Um, I invented an act activity about this, which it's documented online. People will be welcome to try it, but it's it's essentially the short version of it is, um, uh, well, I'll try to give you the short version of it, um, that we tend to compare comics to storyboards, right? So, you know, and, th and there's certainly similar things. You care, you know, each each frame of a storyboard is is kind of like each panel in a comic. Except in storyboards, we we only care about what goes in the frame. But in comics, and this is Windsor McKay's Little Nemo from around 1908, if we white out the content, um, you can still kind of get a sense that there's this bed and then it grew. I mean, it really grew and then it collapsed, right? Like something happened. So in comics, you not only care about what gets drawn in the frame, but you care about the size of the frame, the shape of the the panel, shape of the panel, the the orientation of the panel, uh, the what it's next to, what it's not next to, and its overall placement on the page. So when you start thinking about that, as my activity makes you do, um, you you discover you can embed a lot of content in the way you move the reader and the way you make the reader feel. Um, and so for me composition matters composition matters how i structure it matters a lot and and not everybody cares about this as much some people do six panel grids and that's just what they do and that's got its own kind of rhythms to it but everything you do is giving a kind of rhythm to how you tell your story so i'm going to jump um so this this page um just got a couple more pages here and then i'll, I'll wrap this up um this is a page in Unflattening about, uh, I'm referencing James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, a thing about water flow. Um, and he asked this question, did it flow? And then he starts detailing all the place, all the things that went into turning his faucet on, like where the water came from. And I wanted the page to like move the same way that I felt that water flowed or pipes went. Um, and so it goes this way. And then you hit this sort of anchoring piece that, that leads to here. And, and the art is all the same through these things. It's all one image. So it sort of anchors you to go that way. And the steam takes you into this. And then the rain falls to take you here. And then we do another one of these. So we snake through the page. So it's, it's I wanted the page to feel that kind of movement. Um, this page, uh, this is referencing the, the Arabian Nights, Thousand and One Nights, uh, uh, Scheherazade. And I wanted the page, it, it both does these zooms, these nested, images the way that that Scheherazade's stories are but it also it moves the way I feel like her name is um you know whether an S or a Z like that's Scheherazade it just feels like how her stories go they meander across the page um this one is sort of about kaleidoscopic vision and so I'm coming at it from multiple ways at the same time um so so I I think you know, for to me, comics are this profoundly powerful way to represent thinking. And then the 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 flip side of that, and, and I may not say as much about it, but a profoundly powerful way to generate thinking. Um, working with image and text from the start, uh, you know, people often ask me, you know, how what comes first, words or pictures? And I say, yes. And, and I'm not just being sarcastic there. I, it really is when I have those two together, it starts to teach me where I want to go. Um, and I share, I share this, uh, this, this is the first sketch map I made uh, for unflattening that's reproduced in the back of the book. Um, and I share it because, I mean, it's kind of cool to me to see the Easter eggs of what happened and what didn't. But I think it's important to share too, because uh, one, you know, I think when you see finished art and you're not a drawer, you think it's magic, right? Like it just came out of your head fully formed. And instead it's this mess. It's this mess and I iterate it and things happen. Um, and, and anybody can make this kind of mess, right? There's no special skill in being able to do this. Um, and the, the other side of that is, as I really like to point out, that it's not a picture of my thinking. This is it. The kind of work I make exists because I start with images and text at the same time. 
and they take me places and they take me places I don't expect. So if I written something and said, I'm going to add some words to it, uh, it would be very different than what I do. And, and often, uh, you know, the way the images have to work together, I have to figure out how to make words go that way because they don't, like if I was writing a sort of linear sentence, um, I'm like, but that doesn't work with the pictures. Uh, it doesn't work. I mean, it makes this a nightmare for translators. Um, so I want to get, I'm going to just jump to one more thing. Am I good to jump to one more thing? Do, 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 do. Yes. Yes. All right. Sorry. I got it. <laughs> um, I want to, I want to show two of my student works. Um, and I think they're really important. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, I'll share one more thing of mine. Um, my, my student works, uh, I, these, these are both by non-drawers, uh, self-proclaimed non-drawers. And, um, and I, I think a lot of times I share my work and people buy the argument that like comics is a, is a way of thinking, but they say not for me, right? Not for me. Cause I don't draw. And I often start that grids and gestures activity. I sort of breezed over. I, I start with that a lot because I, I get them to see how much they actually do understand about drawing, about making sharp lines that mean something's angry or excited and curve lines that mean things are, you know, like, you know that, you know, you don't need to know anything about drawing to know that because you've got a body and you know what sharp edges feel like. Um, and to know how much the little decisions you make, like, oh, do I make the boxes go like this or did I overlap them? Like people make those decisions very quickly. Um, but I share this one because like it, it, to come back for the poetry and graphic design, if, if you think comics are about illustration and prose, um, you know, like if you can draw a good nose, then OK, you can make comics. But but I, I don't think that is the key thing. Um, so this guy not only really couldn't draw noses, didn't even try. You see his characters here. None of them have noses. Um, and yet I think it's one of the smartest applications of what comics can do that I've seen. So this is a comic about his grand grandmother who died of Alzheimer's and he didn't really know her. Um, and he does some really neat things with sort of symbolism. Um, he does a lot of stuff, but you know, her body becomes a question mark here. But my favorite parts, uh, he, he, so there's these three blank panels and he says here i didn't know my grandma i was told about her he doesn't draw anything and he doesn't even draw anything and here the person no longer existed again he doesn't draw anything and then she was nobody so he uses this repetition repetitive grid um you know so he sort of taught us how to read it and then he leaves this part blank not because he couldn't have figured out something to draw but because that was the most powerful thing he could draw is to leave it blank and that to me you know, like, did his drawing skills improve in the class? Maybe not. But did his thinking skills in space, did his ability to make narrative through through the sequential and the simultaneous, the way a panel can be a, a frame and the way it can be a structure? It's great. And so uh, this, this this last one I'll share. Um, she was a very shy student, um, not a drawer. Just uh, this was a creative writing class or something. I don't, I'm not sure what the students came from. Um, but... Uh, uh, but she, this is a, the middle part of her final. Um, but but you'll see here. So she's got these negative words and it says sometimes she could feel the weight of the words on her shoulders. It says, but she is strong and these positive words emanating from the sun. Um, and, you know, so she's already mirrored the two pages, right? So she's made some pretty great choices there. And then here, and I, I sort of skimmed over those slides, but she talks about the panel as both a panel, but also as a physical part of the page. And we, we did a lot of that in the class. This is a story about a girl who couldn't fit in a box and they laugh from their boxes that fit as she contorted and twisted, unable to find a place. And finally, um, so she makes her own box out of words, sounds, and pictures. And soon she learns that there is no need for borders, that boxes restrict her unnecessarily since she can go anywhere she wishes. So yeah, right, right. I mean, I've read this like a thousand times and I, every time I'm, I'm just equally moved by it. Um, she was not a maker. She didn't come out of this as like a strong illustrator. Like you wouldn't hire her to make, you know, fancy illustrations or something at this point. But she understood something about the form that allowed her to say things about herself that that surprised her and to say them in ways that are still, you know, when you talk about being inspired, like 
you know, like, can I make a page, you know, she didn't even use pictures, right? But it makes me move in directions, uh, you know, like, that's just such a brilliant choice. And I think one that that is definitely accessible to everyone. Um, so so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this sort of long bit up here. But I think ultimately, like, like, I, I came to comics, back to comics as as a way of making things accessible. Like I wanted to make this, this content, uh, that big idea is accessible. But what I really learned early on is that it changed how I thought. And I think what I've learned going forward on and with my students is it's just, it's a different way of thinking. Is bringing in, bringing in the visual from the start, it changes the way you start to organize ideas and the way you can layer ideas. Um, and I think now, um, We've had the good fortune to have uh, to think about dance, but to have people make dances of my work, and and that's prompted me to think more about it. But to think about comics making, or at least you know, probably all art making, but as a kind of choreography, in that, <clears throat> how do I want you, the reader, to 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 feel as you move through this? So it's not just, and and I, I don't. I don't want to say something that feels like it's dem denigrating any other kind of cartoonist because it's it's not at all. It's it's saying this is for me. Um, how do I how do I get you to move in a way that that feels like the ideas I'm getting in right? And because I don't tend to make stories in a in a more traditional sense. Like I don't have a character that has a character arc. I have an idea arc. Um, each page has some different challenges about you know, how, where do the ideas hit? And then because I'm thinking about that, it often changes what I research. You know, even though I like come into a page with a certain body of research, then I leave the page having to go work, find more of the research, which then comes back and then says, oh, I, you know, so it's a very slow moving process, but it's all, um, it's, it's, you know, in iterating this, I sort of find the idea and I find the best way to, or at least, a way uh, to embody that idea on the page. Um, and I, I think about this a lot. I really think about this idea of, of, of time being written in space and, and how things emerge. And I'll just, Sarah, sneak peek at the new work. Um, you know, I said before that, that um, you know, if you're a non-maker, you tend to think of things as emerging fully formed, like Athena coming out of uh, Zeus's brow, right? But, but but that's just not how it is. It's this circuitous, it's this incredibly circuitous journey um, where you're trying things. And and for me, and, and maybe this is a good place to, to wrap it. Uh, let me see, I click here. Um, I really, I find that, that my skill at drawing badly uh, has really served me well in that I make sloppy images and then I reinterpret them. And I reinterpret them and they teach me things. And in this big sort of mess that I make, um, I start to understand things in a different way. Um, so I, 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 you know, um, I'm not quite sure how to wrap this up, except I think so hard about not just what I draw, but about how like this in the green here is which, which way the text reads and it's different in each one. So how text reads versus how certain images read, you know, like, like how do we think about all those things and, and give the reader a really a different experience in ourselves as makers. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll I'll leave it at that if that's all right, and uh, I'll stop my share here. <laughs>